皆様大変長らくお待たせいたしましたただいまより東大先端圏経済安全保障プログラムおよび European Value Center for Security Policy 協賛のシンポジウム日中東欧協力の新たな時代へ経済安保 Disinformation 台湾を開演いたします本日司会を務めさせていただきます東京大学教育学部文化一類2年生の峯岸亜美と申します本日はどうぞよろしくお願いいたします Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience We are now ready to commence the symposium titled Toward a New Era of Japan Central and Eastern Europe New era, era of Japan, Central and Eastern Europe Collaboration, Economic Security, Counter Disinformation, and Taiwan. This symposium is organized by the Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Tokyo and the European Value Center for Security Policy. My name is Ami Minigishi, a sophomore in the Division of Human Science I in the Faculty. Of liberal arts at the University of Tokyo, and I will be your moderator for today's event. I kindly ask for your cooperation and attention. まず、東京大学先端科学技術研究センターの杉山所長に開演のご挨拶をいただきます。皆様、杉山所長に大きな拍手をお願いします。Firstly, we are honored to have an opening address from Director Sugiyama. Of the Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Tokyo. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a hearty round of applause for Director Sugiyama. So, good afternoon.、Uh, I am very much pleased、uh, to host the、uh, excellent guest、uh, from both the Czech Republic and also the Taiwan、uh, to host a very interesting and very important workshop.、Uh, I am the、uh, director of this、uh, research institute, ARCAST, Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology. And my name is Masakazu Sugiyama.、Uh, thank you so much for attending this symposium. So,、uh, talking about the,、uh, our institute, our guest,、uh, we are pursuing the,、uh, the frontiers or advanced field in the society. Since the, our institute is not specialized in any of the specific disciplines, but actually mixing different disciplines together, the world is getting much more complex, as you conceive. And、uh, I think that、uh, none of the、uh, individual disciplines is sufficient、uh, to solve such a complex problem. And I myself is majoring in the energy issue. I'm a、uh, say, scientist or the engineer in the materials、uh, for the photovoltaic and also the hydrogen production.、So、that's why I am、uh, quite a, say, sincerely、uh, aiming at the、uh, realization of the carbon neutrality. But, The carbon neutrality is, of course, under the assumption of the sufficient energy supply. Otherwise, always the insufficiency of the energy supply for the food supply would be the largest risk of the security in the world, as we witness nowadays. So,、uh, we now strongly realize that the, such a necessity and a dream. Of the carbon neutrality is strongly linked to the、uh, international、uh, geographic, geography and also international geosecurity and some、uh, military affairs, unfortunately. So、uh, we need to be more, how to say, the flame minded to incorporate any of the、uh, contemporary ideas、uh, to solve the uh, compl uh, co very complex problem. That necessitates、uh, not only the single specialist, but the collaboration among the prominent specialists from the different sectors is very important, I think. That's why I myself is now 
establishing a new unit of combining our engineers or scientists from the side of the uh, technology for carbon neutrality and also the researchers who are analyzing the uh, state-of-the-art uh, situation in the Middle East countries or even the uh, uh, Middle East uh, European region that, that is now going to be invaded by Russia, unfortunately. Right. So the, that kind of the uh, good collaboration or good cross-talk is very important. Formerly, in the field of the information science, Cross-talk is a kind of some noise, right? So the uh, people who are developing some information devices are always trying very hard to avoid the cross-talk among the different information. But I think now the cross-talk is very essential to solve uh, difficult problems, complex problems. So that's why I'm very proud of my own position of uh, being a director of this institute which is combining quite a diversified disciplines, not only field of the science or technology, but also the social science, and even the people who are handicapped are working very actively here. So such kind of the uh, collaboration is normally very difficult because the conversation uh, is not straightforward among the uh, different sectors, which is the thing, our situation I always witness. But I think that the members of this research institute, Arceus, are very strongly motivated uh, to have such a cross-talk interaction among the different fields, aiming at the realization of the better, richer, brighter future, which coexists uh, with, of course, the planetary boundary. That kind of the uh, is a objective is not easy to realize, of course, but without our naive effort, such a dream never uh, will come true. In that sense, uh, we members of the ARCAST are very strongly prepared to have such a widespread and a very honest discussion among the different sectors. And today, I think that uh, we have very interesting and prominent guests uh, from uh, Europe and Taiwan, especially Czech Republic, uh, which is a very interesting country from my own, own point of view, because I'm a very a fanatic man of the classical music. So Dvorak, uh, Smetana, right? These are, of course, the source of the, uh, my the hearing always. Right? But anyway, so talking about such a hearing, it's very important because my belief is that the hearing or the emotion it's a catalyst to facilitate such a communication or the cross-disciplinary discussion among the different sectors. Because we need to discuss quite different and difficult things together. Sometimes uh, we feel quite a disparate situation uh, among the very tight boundary conditions. But if we can share desire, wish, and good emphasis, among the different sectors or different people, even a different, different nationalities. I believe that we should be able to construct a better future. That's a belief uh, in my Arcast. And today, I think that a lot of the uh, interesting and important discussion about the uh, international security and also the information security or some sort of disinformation issue will be uh, quite, uh, say, deeply discussed. That uh, is, those are, of course, a very, very important piece uh, to ensure um, not only the uh, say economical security, but also the, our mental security. So the, the world is not composed of just a substance, but uh, by human being, right? And a human being is always uh, with emotion, emphasis. So in that sense, it's, I think, very important for us to secure security among all but the different aspects, right? The economy, materials, uh, energy, food, everywhere, including the mental security as well. So in that sense, I think it's very important at the starting point to establish a reliable relationship among the people here and develop a very open and honest discussion 
on how to realize better, brighter society among the, uh, upon the collaboration among the different nationality, among the collaboration uh, between the people and the nature and other animals and even the planet or yes, so plants, of course. So uh, in such a very diverse concept, I hope that today's uh, discussion might be very fruitful. And also, our artist collaboration with the Czech Republic will be much more strengthened, which actually enhances the vital route, uh, which has been uh, previously lacking, but uh, will surely strengthen the world network uh, supported by such a trust and also the uh, emphasis. So thank you so much for your uh, collaboration. And I do hope that uh, this symposium workshop will be a very important initial step uh, towards the uh, next more fruitful uh, collaboration platform. Thank you so much. ヤマ社長ありがとうございました。続きまして、中日地区協和国大使のマルチンクルチャル閣下に特別講演をいただく予定でしたが、残念ながら本日クルチャル様は諸事情により起こしになることができなくなりました。従いまして、今回のスピー
is the head of Taiwan Office of the European Value Center for Security Policy. He also serves as an analyst contributing to the center's research on Taiwan and the broader uh, Indo-Pacific region. And today, he is going to discuss Central and Eastern Europe's approach to Taiwan. Martin J. Jarzewski, please give a warm round of applause for Mr. Martin Jarzewski. Finally, panel discussion or the discussion of the panel 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 Thank you so much, Ami, for that introduction. Um, I wasn't expecting you to do it in both languages, so uh, you know, kudos to that. Um, so you may have noticed this, but uh, uh, Ami seems very young. She's still an undergraduate student here at the University of Tokyo. This whole symposium's logistics has also been uh, basically done by the students with the hopeful leadership of Masato sitting right there. So uh, you know, this wouldn't have been possible without the help from our young uh, undergraduate students helping us. So. On your way out, uh, if you see a student, please uh, tell him or her to say thank you for making this possible. Um, a quick note, uh, we are trying to create this new youth development type of programs at RCAST Economic Security Research Program. Uh, my idea is that uh, we will try to bring in these young students to not just help out with the logistic of the symposium, but also give them the opportunity to have their own workshops, to give them their own time to speak to the speakers. For example, today, uh, between 11 to 12, we had a separate uh, lesson from our David Thoman, who also uh, has come from Prague. To, so please give a round of applause to uh, David. Um, he has studied in Waseda for a couple of years, so he speaks very good Japanese as well. But um, I guess my point here is that uh, these, uh, youth, if any of you from uh, in the audience interested in issues of economic security, uh, in disinformation, in issues related to the Indo-Pacific, and is interested in joining this uh, youth development type of program, then we haven't really started it yet, but we are trying to do something substantive. So please reach out to me or any of the students after the symposium. So having that said, uh, I think we would like to start uh, with uh, Jakob Yanda uh, to talk a little bit about the economic security issues from the Central Eastern Europe region. Jakob? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Akira-san, and thank you to, also to Masakazu-san. Thank you very much for hosting us here. It's been a great mm -hmm. privilege and experience for all of our team here, coming from Prague and also from Taipei, where Marcin is located, where he has our office. Um, so we are very happy to talk about it and also do more projects and work together in the future. Um, so I'll talk about the content directly. So I'll talk about Central Eastern Europe and, I mean, the economic security components of, of our policy focusing mainly on Russia and on China. And I'll make it very simplified for the sake of discussion and happy to go more into detail much later. But uh, if you look to Central Eastern European relations to Russia in recent, you could say, basically two decades, uh, you can see quite a lot of uh, similarities, quite a lot of similar approaches uh, by most countries in our region. And uh, it basically comes from pretty much a strategic understanding or that for us, sitting in Central Eastern Europe, Russia is and will be the major military threat. And I'm afraid we could see it today as Russia is killing in Ukraine. Uh, but also Russia is endangering Central Eastern Europe, many of countries which are part of NATO and the EU, such as Baltic countries. Uh, so this long-term understanding has been present in capitals of Central Eastern Europe. There are some exceptions, countries and governments which decided to basically attempt to become allies of Russia, such as the current government of Hungary, but pretty much the whole region, with some of these small exceptions, pretty much understands what Russia does, and the current Russian government is a major threat to our whole region. It's a, it is an existential threat, military threat, but uh, the military threat is not only in this field, it's also in the field of economic security. And for our region, for last approximately 15 years, Central Europe has been thinking about how can we actually be more resilient to Russia, to Russian hostile attempts in economic security. 
And if you look through the structure of, of Russian economy and Russian statecraft, uh, the main tool has been energy. So basically, Russian energy exports to Europe, to make it very simplified. Uh, so much of center Europe has been thinking about how can we decrease our dependency on Russian energies, mainly, mainly oil and gas, um, and how to make it long term, how to actually be, be sure that we will be safe once Russia decides to use energy as a weapon. And that's something what countries like Poland and the Baltic nations have actually been in the front forefront understanding this long term, and they start to either build physical infrastructure, basically the pipelines, the tools, the, the vehicles, how they can transfer energy from other sources, uh, so they are not dependent on Russia. So effectively, the long-term policy of center Europe, again, making it simplified, has been to decouple from Russia in energy dependency. It has not been easy. It has been very pricey, very expensive. But just the, the fact that countries in our region, mainly led by Poland in this case, have built this long-term infrastructure uh, now, meaning last two years, after Russia launched a large war against Ukraine and in Ukraine, uh, we, the, the region has been prepared in this particular field. So it has not been so costly to really decouple it from Russia in a matter of a couple of months in energy deliveries to Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, overall, it has cost us a lot, money-wise, but the region has been prepared, with some exceptions. Um, very particular thing to focus on, and just to give you a very short case study, in the case of Czech Republic, which now has a government and president and parliament which actually understands Russian and Chinese threat very well, we were not there a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, we had a government and a president which were openly siding with Russia and China and their leaderships. Uh, and as a citizen, as a think tanker, I hated that, honestly. So what we tried to do as a think tank during that time, approximately 2015 to 2019, approximately, we tried to actually make sure that uh, there would be policy decisions which would not endanger long-term de democracy and sovereignty of the Czech Republic. So the effort during that time was, for example, for Russia and also China to compete over a nuclear power plant tender in the Czech Republic. Uh, something what, for example, the Hungarian government decided to do to hand over a strategic contract over one of the nuclear power plants to Russia. That's something what the Czech government tried to do a couple of years ago. Uh, there was a lot of pushback against that, and happy to go into detail later. But the result of the overall situation is that currently, Czech Republic has a, has a national law which forbids countries which are openly hostile to the Czech Republic to actually have major presence in our strategic energy projects, which basically means nuclear energy, nuclear power plants. Uh, it has not been easy. It has also been very complicated how to do it legally. How can you actually ban, in this case, Russia and China, and obviously Iran for, or North Korea, from participating in such energy projects? How to do it legally so you win at court when they sue you, for example? So that has been a tough fight, but it worked out, and we are there now. So happy to go into detail later. But now, in the last part of my short presentation, I will talk about uh, Central Eastern Europe and our approach to China in the field of economic security. And there I have to say we are really at the beginning at this moment. Uh, so uh, the understanding from our region, from Central Europe, is obviously we see China being more and more hostile, more and more hostile to Taiwan, to Japan, to the Philippines. That's pretty much in your region. But in our region, which is, which is something like 10,000 kilometers away from here, our thinking is, well, we see what, how, how hostile the Chinese government is to us. There was a lot of promises of, of huge investment, positive relations coming out of the Chinese government to center Europe. But the only thing which we got over the last five years was more hostility, more Chinese espionage against our companies and, and institutions, uh, more open blackmail by the Chinese government against our even political leaders. We had, for example, speaker of the Senate of my country who really wanted to visit Taiwan, and he got open threats by the Chinese government. There was even a letter, a public, uh, oh, sorry, an official letter signed by the Chinese embassy in Prague delivered to the speaker of, of, the, of the parliament in Czech Republic, threatening him personally if he travels to, 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 to Taiwan, as he can, honestly, because he is a leader of a sovereign country. Uh, so these things actually were even targeting specific Czech companies, naming them, Chinese government even named Czech companies, who will be crushed in China 
if Czech politicians, for example, visit Taiwan? Uh, and do you expect us to actually just sit and listen and say, oh, I'm sorry, China, we will not visit Taiwan because you hate it? No. Fortunately, we had political leaders who decided to go ahead and visit Taiwan. So, for example, till today, um, I mean, Czech Republic, I believe, is the global leader in this case, in, num in a specific indicator, in number of uh, speakers of parliament visiting Taiwan. We have sent two speakers of our parliament to Taiwan, one in 2020, one in 2023. And to put it more, more on the joking side, we are better than the United States, who only sent one. So, uh, I mean, I know this is not the only indicator, but I think this only shows that there are efforts to be done positively. To finish up on the economic security angle in Central Europe, uh, is that uh, there are countries who are openly trying to build political and economic and security relations with Taiwan, and Martin will be talking more in detail about it, so I will leave it more to him. But um, in practice, in terms of toolkit, uh, the EU countries already have put in, put in place screening of foreign investment. So to put it very simply, if hostile countries such as China actually want to buy some of the companies in sensitive sectors in European countries, in EU countries, they have to first apply, uh, put an application towards the, 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 the local government, in this case the Czech government, and there is like a formal mechanism where all of our intelligence agencies look into it and say, is it okay or is it risky? Can, can this, in this case, for example, the potential Chinese investor, for example, get some sensitive technology which you, we do not want, for example, the Chinese military to have because they could use it against Japan or Taiwan? That's the question. And we have, so we have, as Europeans, we have put this tool together, and now it's in practice in most of EU countries, which is pretty good. Uh, but, so that's the positive part. The negative part, which we don't have yet, and we need to work on that, is that we, as Europeans, we do not yet um, audit or study, uh, analyze, how are our strategic dependencies on China. Because we know China uses economic and technological dependencies to blackmail countries. Uh, and China will be using it once they escalate, hopefully not militarily, but once China escalates around Taiwan or Japan or the Philippines, definitely the Chinese government will squeeze European companies and squeeze these dependencies to make sure that Europeans do not come to help in, for example, sanctioning China as we should. So this is the problem we have as Europeans. We have dependencies, technological and economic ones on China, um, and we are not really sure how these dependencies really work, how big they are, where they really are in Europe. Uh, so that's something what we want to focus on in the future, because um, the, let's say, the big lesson from the Russian attack on Ukraine for any Europeans is that if you are dependent on the dictator, it's bad because the dictator will use it against you. I mean, it sounds very not really sophisticated, right? But in, ter in practical terms, this is what it, what, what's our big lesson from the Russian attack on Ukraine. But we have so much homework in Europe. We are not, not in a good position yet, I'm afraid, in most of the places. Um, so I'll stop here because I think we'll discuss more later. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for that comprehensive talk. You talked about the protection of critical infrastructure, the importance of energy security, worsening Chinese threat perception, uh, how to counter espionage, how to work with economic coercion, uh, dealing with foreign investment screening, how to reduce strategic dependence on China. I mean, this shows that Japan and the Czech Republic basically has the same problems and tackling in both similar but in times different ways. So maybe we can address some of those issues. Later on, let me also ask you a, a couple of a difficult questions, perhaps, about uh, because you seem very hawkish uh, against China, which is a little bit different from your previous administration. So maybe a little bit of a question of what would happen if the next administration comes in, or a question about how the surrounding other Central Eastern Europe uh, countries are looking at this, because not all countries are as uh, hawkish as the Czech Republic at the moment on China. So with that, uh, why don't I pass the floor to Zutka? Hello, thank you. Thank you for the floor. And uh, it's my great honor to be here and to speak uh, to such a, a beautiful audience. Um, so I would like to follow on what uh, Jakub said, and I will focus more on disinformation and influence operations in Central and Eastern Europe, um, in particular Czech Republic. And I would like to start, um, what Jakub already mentioned, but maybe put it uh, more in context. Uh, so in the region of Central and Eastern Europe, 
of course, Russia is the threat number one. And um, for example, from Czech Republic to uh, borders with Ukraine, it's only 300 kilometers. It's even closer than from Tokyo to Osaka. So just uh, to illustrate how um, how difficult or how important the topic is uh, is for Czechs and for other countries in Central and Eastern Europe. And um, um, it can be also illustrated on very various strategic documents which uh, capitals all over the Europe are accepting in recent years, such as uh, security strategies. Um, Czech Republic published its own security strategy last year. And uh, in these documents, you can see that Russia is, um, is named as the threat number one, uh, which is a um, threat to the European security. Um, however, the threat number two is China. And this is something I would like to focus more in my uh, presentation. Um, when it comes to disinformation, uh, again, uh, the bigger uh, threat uh, is Russia. And it's understandable as uh, for the geographic reasons, but also uh, language reasons, as Czech and other Slavic languages are uh, closer to Russian languages. Um, we share some, uh, some cultural similarities as well. And Russia has been really visible and vocal on Czech media and other European media. Uh, there were versions of uh, Chinese state media, uh, like Pravda or Sputnik or uh, Russian TV. Uh, but uh, those were, with uh, the invasion of Russian, uh, Russia to Ukraine, uh, those were shut. This is uh, a great uh, example of, um, of a success of European countries to find an agreement, and uh, Sputnik and Russia Today uh, were actually shut. Uh, however, Russia, uh, propaganda, Russian propaganda has been also uh, very present on social media, such as Facebook, in various, um, various groups, um, where the where disinformation about uh, war in Ukraine or invasion of Russia to Ukraine has been spread and is spread until today. Um, however, China is also active on these platforms. And this is something that I would like to talk about more in detail how uh, China, um, about Chinese influence operations in, in uh, European countries. Um, so I will start with um, some kind of overview. Uh, what is very pressing to Czechia and other uh, CE countries is the elite capture. And this was really visible in the period of time which I could already mentioned around 2013 to 2020, when we had a very pro-Russian and pro-Chinese president and also government. And they were looking for uh, Chinese investments uh, and money flowing to the region of Central and Eastern Europe. That never happened, actually, in, 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 in the reality. Um, it was more um, about corruption and gaining, uh, gaining power in this region. Uh, but it was not only about politicians. It was also business elites, journalists, etc. Uh, another s influential uh, sphere is academic sphere, and I'm sure you have similar experience here in Japan too. Um, collaboration with different different academics, uh, invitation for conferences to China, joint research project, but uh, also on the other side, it's the foreign students coming. Some of them they they, they do have their agenda to uh, you know to spread a good or the Chinese version uh, of uh, of the, on different topics. Um, and uh, the second aspect of the academic, uh, on the academic sphere is the Confucius Institutes. So um, currently in Czechia, they are not that active. There is one which is really, or one or two which are really active. Uh, but um, I would say that Czech academic, um, Czech academic sphere understands uh, that uh, there are some threats and um, problems associated with the Confucius Institutes in, in Czechia. <clears throat> Next, the field I would like to talk about is, again, disinformation, in particular with, uh, with regards with China. Uh, so something what I would call uh, Chinese hypocrisy on uh, social media is uh, the fact that uh, some Western social media are banned in China, in mainland China. But uh, the Chinese official state media, they are very active on them, such as uh, uh, X, or previously known as Twitter, or Facebook. So you have the Xinhua News Agency uh, posting daily many posts on Twitter with beautiful photos, sharing um, success stories from mainland China, and sharing the Chinese 
point of view or Chinese propaganda in English or in traditional Chinese targeting, uh, targeting foreigners. Um, you have also um, active comment commentators on these medias. Uh, then uh, you have, uh, we have in Czech, Czech media, um, various cooperation, which is not um, stated on the website. So such a, to give an example, um, uh, there is a, news, uh, a newspaper called Literární noviny, so something like literature newspapers, and they have collaboration with Kuangmin Rupao, uh, Kuangmin Daily from mainland China. But, uh, so they are translating directly the articles from Kuangmin Rupao, bringing them to Czech audiences, but the collaboration is not stated on the websites. So it looks like that the, that the media is publishing it themselves, but actually it's just translations of uh, the Chinese state media. And then you have paid advertisements, which are um, also difficult sometimes to distinguish. So it can appear in printed media, but also online. Uh, it looks like a normal article, but actually it's an advertisement. So um, I just wanted to give you a few examples how the disinformation can look like and how it can be used uh, by foreign powers to influence, to influence um, opinions. And uh, that can be also illustrated on if this has been effective. And I have one case, uh, case study to share with you. So, for example, during the COVID pandemics, um, uh, there was a, a survey done in Czech Republic, uh, and uh, it asked the citizens of Czechia um, about who they believe was more helpful to tackle uh, the pandemics, if it was EU or China. And majority of the respondents actually thought that China was more helpful, providing more help and more support to Czechia than the EU, which definitely is not the case. So I would like to close here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dutka. Um, later on, again, I might ask you a couple of hard questions, uh, mostly about the uh, degree of China-Russia nexus on disinformation collaboration in Central Eastern Europe, if you can address some of that. Uh, the issue of elite capture, uh, I want to ask about uh, perhaps how to counter this effectively. And then lastly, maybe the impact of generative AI on all of this. Are you already seeing this in CE? What are you looking at? How can we counter it? And so on. So uh, with that, our last speaker is going to take us on a tour of Central Eastern Europe to compare and contrast different policies towards Taiwan. So take it away, Martin. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to speak uh, to a distinguished audience here at the uh, University of Tokyo. I think that we are all very well aware of the strong linkages between Taiwan and Japan, and it is uh, really um, an opportune moment to start talking about potential opportunities to take this, uh, these linkages to the next level and uh, utilize them for more trilateral cooperation um, frameworks. In my uh, presentation today, I would like to uh, make uh, quick seven points. Firstly, briefly comment on the development of relations between Taiwan and Central Eastern Europe, then uh, remark on uh, the heterogeneity of uh, the region, which also translates into divergent approaches uh, towards engaging Taiwan. Um, the two case studies that I would like to shed light on are Poland and uh, Lithuania. So. Um, I will speak uh, about the current state of Poland-Taiwan relations and also specifically about the role of the China factor in shaping Poland-Taiwan relations. Um, the second case study, which I think is particularly interesting, is that of Lithuania, given that uh, Vilnius has truly positioned itself as an early stalwart of closer ties between Taiwan and Central Eastern Europe. However, the sustainability of this relationship remains uncertain right now, with Lithuania gearing up for a presidential election in May and uh, a parliamentary election in October. Uh, 2024 is uh, truly a year of elections around the globe, and um, Taiwan started it off with um, a, a big electoral contest in, the, in early uh, January. So I also want to remark very briefly on uh, how the results of the elections may shape uh, Taiwan-Europe uh, relations. And then uh, I will conclude by uh, very uh, briefly talking about potential lessons from Japan for European countries on how to engage Taiwan uh, without crossing too many red lines. 
So starting with the first point uh, related to the historical relationship between Taiwan and the region. While it is true that the uh, current opening in relations between Taiwan and Central Eastern Europe, which uh, we are observing, uh, has uh, began approximately with the onset of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic when public trust towards uh, China began to decline in Europe and specifically in Central Eastern Europe, we should bear in mind that this is not the first time when uh, Taiwan is trying to get closer to the region. Taiwan and countries of Central Eastern Europe are Huntingtonian third wave democracies, and they uh, share many similarities in their respective trajectories of uh, political development, uh, particularly the start of transition from authoritarianism to democracy. And the early 90s were a very exciting time for Taiwan Central Eastern Europe relations, where uh, countries like Latvia and uh, then newly independent uh, post Soviet Republic even experimented with the notion of challenging the uh, One China policy and uh, debating whether they could simultaneously recognize governments in Beijing and Taipei. While it did not come to fruition, it, led, uh, it established a foundation, an institutional foundation for bilateral relations. And uh, in the case of the Czech Republic, um, the legacy of uh, President Václav Havel is also extremely important. In 1995, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the United Nations, uh, Havel, despite the uh, contradictory advice from his own foreign minister, advocated for inclusion of Taiwan in the works of uh, the United Nations on the floor of the uh, General Assembly. This is important because I would like to highlight that the current opening in relations between Taiwan and Central Eastern Europe didn't come out of nowhere. And even though in the 90s we didn't see much institutionalization of relations between Taiwan and Central Eastern Europe, it is definitely an important um, source of institutional knowledge, particularly for stakeholders in Taiwan, um, to build upon. At the same time, Central and Eastern Europe is not a homogenous region, and there is quite a lot of um, variation in how individual countries uh, approach Taiwan. Last year, uh, I was a part of a, a research project called Beyond the Dumpling Alliance, which was coordinated by, the, uh, by our uh, sister organization, uh, the Central European Institute for Asian Studies. Uh, the so-called uh, Dumpling Alliance is a, a concept which was created by the Taiwan Digital Diplomacy Association. Um, it was inspired by the so-called uh, Milk Tea Alliance, so and, 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 and a social media uh, association of pro-democracy activists from Asia. Uh, so the Dumpling Alliance was uh, a, a, a similar um, informal collective term for um, friendly collaboration between democratic countries in um, Central Eastern Europe and including uh, Taiwan. So uh, the four participants of the Dumpling Alliance uh, would be the Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, Poland, and Lithuania. And these countries would be uh, classified as the vanguards of the relationship. So um, they show the greatest level of political and economic engagement with Taiwan, with Czechia and Lithuania being most vocal, but Poland and Slovakia also engaging um, very actively, particularly in the economic realm. The second category of countries in Central Eastern Europe when it comes to their engagement with Taiwan would be the pragmatists. Uh, the, Central Eastern European countries that have very strong economic ties to Taiwan, but are perhaps more reserved to engage with Taiwan in the political domain. And these countries would include Austria and Hungary. Uh, interestingly, Hungary is actually the largest destination for Taiwan's outward foreign direct investment to Europe. The last category would include the laggards, those countries in Central Eastern Europe that have barely any interactions um, with Taiwan, weak ties both politically and economically, um, and this could include uh, European Union uh, member states in um, the Balkan region or um, up until now also the Baltic states of um, Latvia and Estonia. So um, we have this unprecedented opening in Taiwan Central Eastern Europe relations, but it remains to be seen whether it will be uh, possible for the new Lai administration to maintain it after the um, elections. If you follow Taiwanese politics, you may know that uh, the two-party system in Taiwan is undergoing a profound uh, transition with a third party emerging as a, a critical minority. This means that 
even though in Taiwan's semi-presidential system, uh, Lai Qingde and the Democratic Progressive Party will have a lot to say in terms of defining Taiwan's foreign policy and will likely continue the trajectory of diversification put in place by President Tsai Ing-wen, they may face difficulties in um, negotiating with the legislative UN, where no party has a majority, but the, uh, the uh, Chinese Nationalist Party, or the Guomindang, uh, has the largest number of uh, legislators. As a part of this ongoing opening in relations between Taiwan and Central Eastern Europe, there have been several big ticket initiatives, such as the Taiwan Czechia mega project, um, which require uh, consent from the legislative UN in terms of uh, budget allocations. Uh, another potential concern is the fact that in relations between Taiwan and the European Union as a whole, not just Taiwan and Central Eastern Europe, human rights cooperation uh, plays a very important role. And even though Taiwan uh, truly aspires to be the Asia's shining city upon a hill in terms of its uh, human rights um, uh, approach, there are still some areas of concern identified by the uh, European Union. For example, Taiwan's status as a, a retentionist country in terms of uh, death penalty, uh, situation of migrant workers, and so on. Unfortunately, in the last parliamentary election, a lot of progressive candidates did not retain their seats or failed to um, win new seats in their respective constituencies, which uh, combined with the higher representation of the Chinese Nationalist Party in the legislative union might hinder process on those items. Um, now, very quickly moving on to um, the case studies, uh, Poland and Lithuania, starting with Poland. Informal relations between Poland and Taiwan are relatively well institutionalized. Both sides uh, signed a number of important agreements, for example, an agreement on avoidance of dual taxation, which is um, of uh, great significance for strengthening economic ties, and also an agreement on cooperation in uh, criminal cooperation. At the same time, uh, Poland's highly restrictive definition of one China policy and the government's efforts to avoid antagonizing Beijing um, have led to a situation where country, the country has made relatively little progress in advancing ties with Taiwan politically in comparison to entities such as Czechia and Lithuania. Uh, the expansion of people-to-people -people relations, for example, through a more effective utilization of working holiday programs uh, could increase the salience of Taiwanese issues in Poland. And there is also potential to increase limited economic interactions between Poland and Taiwan, particularly in strategic technologies such as um, semiconductors. Uh, uh, so I think that this illustrates that the China factor plays an important role in um, Taiwan-Poland uh, relations. And um, this is uh, because Poland very early on, so already in the 1990s, has essentially assimilated China's formulation of one China principle as its own one China policy. So in the uh, November 17, 1997 joint statement uh, between the People's Republic of China and the Republic of Poland, um, it was stated explicitly that Poland, quote, recognizes Taiwan as an inalienable part of the Chinese territory. And this definition of Poland's one China policy has been reiterated in several um, documents, including a, a, a an influential internal memorandum of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs published in 2018. Uh, during Xi Jinping's 2016 visit to Poland, um, Warsaw and Beijing also agreed on elevating their relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership, which um, influenced the memorandum, which I uh, mentioned just now. And uh, the memorandum states that, in principle, in case of a clash between Polish-Chinese cooperation projects and Polish-Taiwanese cooperation projects, priority should be given to cooperation with the People's Republic of China. In comparison to other countries in Central Eastern Europe, Warsaw, uh, because of that conservative formulation of one China policy, benefits from relatively limited scrutiny over its dealings with Taiwan, but uh, I believe that time is high for Warsaw to reconsider the formulation of the policy. With uh, Taiwan-Lithuania relations, um, uh, the case of Lithuania is particularly significant because the government in Vilnius has recognized something that Taiwanese diplomats have been talking about for years, that, this, that uh, for Taiwan, symbolism is substance. And the uh, coalition of center and center-right uh, parties in Vilnius allowed Taiwan to establish 
a representative office under the name of Taiwan rather than Taipei, the Taiwanese representative office. It is only uh, the second country in the world that does not formally recognize the Republic of China where a Taiwanese representative office uh, was established. The first one was in Hargisa, Somaliland. At the same time, uh, there is uh, a concern about the sustainability of uh, these relations because if we look at the opinion polls ahead of the um, uh, elections in Lithuania, the parties making up the current coalition are performing very poorly, and the parties leading opinion polls are the openly Taiwan skeptic Lithuanian Farmers and Greens Association, which during, uh, in 2018 and 2019 signed a number of very lucrative deals uh, with the People's Republic of China, granting Lithuanian uh, farmers market access to um, uh, the Chinese market, and also the Social Democrat Party, which in Lithuania is quite divided over the issue of uh, cooperation with uh, Taiwan and China. Uh, additionally, I think that uh, Taiwan has a lot to do in terms of managing Central Eastern European countries' expectations uh, regarding potential economic gains uh, from bilateral cooperation. So Lithuania has benefited significantly from initiatives such as the um, Taiwan Central Eastern Europe Investment Fund. So one of the flagship investment projects uh, supported by the Taiwanese side was in uh, Teltonica, a Lithuanian company in the semiconductor sector. Um, the Teltonica received an 11 million US dollar grant from the Taiwanese foreign ministry uh, to, strength, to um, prepare for the launch of domestic semiconductor production in Lithuania by 2027. And they also collaborate very actively with the government sponsor Institute for um, uh, Industrial uh, Technology uh, Research in Taiwan. Uh, at the same time, there are uh, significant critical voices in Vilnius, for example, in the presidential office uh, under President Zhitanas Naushieda, who is very likely to be um, re-elected, who say that uh, the economic gains from cooperation with Taiwan are not sufficient, and um, that is largely driven by the fact that uh, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, first major investment in Europe is going to be uh, in Dresden, Germany, rather than in the CE region. So. Um, there is a lot of work for both sides, both for Taiwan and Europe, to make sure that the relations um, remain sustainable. Um, I promise that I will conclude briefly with positive lessons from Japan. So, um, firstly, I believe that Japan has been extremely um, uh, apt at using subnational or city diplomacy in engaging Taiwan. Out of uh, all the countries that cooperate with Taiwan through non formal uh, using non-formal tools, Japan has the second largest number of subnational deals with Taiwan after the United States, and they uh, are taking place at uh, a number of levels in Jap on the Japanese side, prefecture, city, but also city ward level, um, in Taiwan at county city, but also individual township levels, and um, that is definitely uh, something that European countries could emulate to a greater extent. So. Um, Japan and Taiwan have uh, almost 100 subnational partnerships right now. The country with the largest number of subnational partnerships in Taiwan and Europe is Poland, and uh, there are three of those. So a lot of space for growth. Uh, additionally, uh, Japan and uh, Taiwan um, have been uh, developing their uh, security cooperation as well, with Japan appointing a serving government official to act as the uh, de facto defense attaché um, in Taipei. And uh, I think that this is also a move that uh, European countries would consider, given that there is already a precedent established by Japan. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Martin. So uh, I think many of you uh, may have been a little bit surprised by all of the three speakers, because um, unless you knew about Czech Republic uh, beforehand, I would have imagined that you know a small and medium-sized country in Europe must be bullied by China, but their economic gains are so high that uh, they can't be hawked. They must be dovish to some extent. But what we heard today was pretty hard line, I think. Um, so for Martin, uh, I'm going to probably ask you later on a, a difficult question about uh, the importance of Taiwan, real importance for Taiwan. Uh, the real importance of Taiwan for the Central Eastern Europe countries, because I feel like when push comes to shove, what does Czechia do? What would Central Eastern Europe countries do? What would NATO do? And 
I feel like it needs to, there needs to be a, a realistic assessment of what would happen. I mean, yes, it's important to talk about economic gains and win-win situations and values and human rights and all of that. But what if something happens? What realistically would happen? That might be one question I would ask you. And then the second question is, you also mentioned a little about human rights issues. But um, if you open the BBC app, for example, over the last week or so, You've heard uh, uh, stories about uh, Volkswagen potentially uh, using some uh, human rights violation, forced labor goods in part of their automobiles, or there has been stories about the BASF also using forced labor and supply chains and whatnot. So, um, you know, European countries always talk about human rights issues and values. Do businesses really care? So with those difficult questions, uh, why don't I go back to Yakov to ask you first the question about uh, potential reverse course in Czechia. Uh, what if the administration changed? What would happen? And then if you want to address or comment uh, anything else that the other speakers have talked about, feel free to do so as well. Thank you. I just also want to state that as a European, I'm honestly very ashamed uh, that, that the German and other European companies are using slave labor in China and de facto assisting Chinese government's policy of genocide against the Uyghurs. I think it's horrible and we should all be ashamed as Europeans by it and put public pressure on these companies to stop it. Um, but to your question very openly, um, so in the case of Czech Republic, the effort of people who see the value in engaging with Taiwan, such as ourselves, but many others in Prague and on Czech Republic in general, the effort is actually to make the relationship as wide as possible. Meaning that it's not only driven by a couple of motivated politicians or think tankers or a couple of couple of core group, but there are there are more institutions who see the value by doing the substantive relationship. So just to name a few things which are happening between Czech Republic and Taiwan for the last couple of years. So just for your context, you pretty much well know the, the United States, right? So you could imagine who is whom in the US. So just imagine the commander of West Point, of the top military education university in, in the United States, openly visiting Taiwan, signing a MOU, being active duty uh, officer or general in practice uh, and doing it. That's exactly what the Czech Defense University did last year. We actually had two active duty generals from the Czech military visiting Taiwan last year. No other Europeans do that. Uh, so they see the value in it. And this, to do such a move, it's, it might sound a bit technocratic, let's say. But to do such a move, it needs to be approved by the Minister of Defense and the Czech government because it's so politically sensitive. And it was. Czech Minister of Defense said, yes, it's good. Let's do it. And so that's why it's, it's possible to do, and now they are exchanging military lectures. So, for example, at this, at this moment, Czech Republic has military-to-military -military relations with Taiwan, thanks to this cooperation. There are no other Europeans doing it. Uh, the other thing just to mention, for example, you all know the FBI, right? The most important country intelligence and uh, law enforcement agency in the United States. The Czech version of FBI, their director general, their top boss, actually visited Taiwan in September last year signed an open cooperation with them, with the MGIB, with the Taiwanese version of FBI, let's say, and they start having practical uh, cooperation on very operative cases. So that's already approved, for example, by the Czech Minister of Interior, who have to approve such decisions. So these things are happening. We have similar relationship between cybersecurity institutions on the civilian side. Um, and, uh, for example, there is more cooperation on civil defense, on helping Taiwanese society to be resilient going to the future as well. So those, those are the projects and very practical government-to-government -government corporations who are, I mean, in a technical way, they are done through the Czech Economic and Cultural Office, a de facto Czech embassy in Taipei. So diplomatically speaking, they are fine. But in practice, this is happening. And I think it's relevant. So one last example to give. In, in um, March 2023, last year, there was a huge delegation visiting Taipei, led by the speaker of one of the Czech uh, the Chamber of Deputies, Marketa Pekarva Adamova, and she led a delegation of approximately 150 people, mainly business leaders from Czech Republic, but also who was present and to took meetings and public pictures with the president of Taiwan, was the head of the Czech Country Intelligence Agency. He personally visited Taiwan, He's an active duty general of the Czech Country Intelligence Agency, visited Taiwan, publicly claimed about it, and they already have a relationship with the, with the Taiwanese counterparts. Why I'm saying it? 
is that it's important to have politicians driving these relations because those are de facto political relations and democratic governments decide based on political will. But it's important to, that it's more than political talk. It's to be substantive. Because if I put it very pragmatically, for Czech Republic, we are a country of almost 11 million people sitting in Central Europe, and we have limited knowledge about China. We don't really know that much in detail about how China operates, how Chinese intelligence agencies work, how Chinese military works. And Taiwan has this knowledge. And we want that knowledge. And Taiwan is providing this knowledge to Czech counterparts in relationship which I mentioned in practical level. So those are things which makes good sense. I'm very proud that my government is willing to do this and I hope it will continue going to the future because there are more and more people in the national security domain, for example, who want that. I know my colleagues will discuss other aspects, but I think this is important to see and all things which I mentioned are publicly known. I'm not saying anything what's private now. So you could really find it in various public sources. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to delve into maybe two minor aspects. Uh, one. So you're right, uh, perhaps the relationship between uh, Czech Republic and Taiwan is becoming institutionalized to some extent, so it's not just about the administration or individual politicians, but if the administration changes, that could potentially lead to a reverse course, or do you think that the public opinion in the Czech Republic has changed, shifted so much that its reverse course is not a realistic option? That's true. We have elections in a year and a half and anything can happen. But what we can see, if the opposition party, which is leading the polls now in Prague, lead, wins, we might see less uh, public talk about Taiwan. But I honestly doubt there would be any major backtracking from the policies which I'm mentioning it. Uh, we will really see in approximately two years. Uh, but that's more on the political level. But if you look through the Czech parliament, now in both chambers what we have, there is basically no single member of parliament who openly supports China. We were there three, four years ago. We had these MPs in our parliament who are saying, let's go to China, let's do great business, blah, blah, blah. But there is none of this like that. Even in our far-right group, political groups, even, even anywhere in the parliament, which honestly shows you where it stands at this moment. The other aspect which is very important is the Czech business community or European business community. Five, seven years ago, we had many businesses hoping they could get to the Chinese market, make great money, but they now see it's um, impossible. The major Czech companies who are physically present in China are either being kicked out or leaving themselves because they see the, the threat to themselves, really, even as physical persons or to their capital, which they basically want to get out of China before it's too late. I know we are in different position than many other European countries who have major investment inside China. We don't really, good for us, I think. Uh, but we, we are dependent through Germany, for example, through the supply chain. So yes, we are worried that if China wants, once China starts pressuring European companies, it will hit Czech Republic through the supply chain, mainly through Germany, because we are interdependent on a European internal market. So yes, we have serious concerns, really, but it's not directly between China and Czech Republic because bilateral trade is almost non-existent, which honestly I think is good for us. And my second point was exactly on your last point about supply chains and human rights, because you were talking about how you were a little bit ashamed of the German companies as a European, but like you said, Czech companies are part of the supply chain of these big German companies, and I would be very surprised if there are no Czech companies in the supply chains of BASF or Volkswagen. And I'm wondering if there is a reporting done in your country talking about how these Czech companies that's part of the supply chains of Volkswagen or BASF should be ashamed of themselves because mm -hmm. they are indirectly contributing to human rights abuse by mm -hmm. being in the supply chain where forced labor is being used, or is this not being talked about much. It's partly discussed. Uh, the largest, one of the largest Czech companies in car making called Škoda, you might know them. They, have, uh, they do have presence in China. Fortunately for all of us, they are getting kicked out pretty much because they lost their business case in China. They are part of the Volkswagen holding or consortium, so they are part of it but they are themselves getting out of China now, but honestly more for business reasons because they failed in the unfair environment, honestly, where they have been, which I think is good news strategically. I think ethically it's horrible because I don't know in detail what, what, how exactly they've been engaging. I assume, but honestly, if you are in China, in general, as a major business, basically whatever you do, you are contributing to support of the, of the dictatorship system, which is actually openly preparing for a major conflict against all of us, against democracies. So I think generally it's bad, but uh, I really hope that they would get investigated with the future due diligence laws in Europe, 
which would really show whether these companies are using slave labor or, and and, if they are contributing or assisting the Chinese government's policy of genocide of Uyghurs. Because many of European companies apparently are, and because we don't have hard European laws on this yet, unlike the US where they have it, our companies are pretty much free to do it, and because they are usually very politically significant given their size, many Europeans are basically closing their eyes, including many of us in, in Central Europe as well, because we basically say, oh, they are great companies, they make great cars, and we just close their eyes where, where they do it. And I think we should stop this practice. And by the way, the reason why I'm asking you all this question is not to name and shame the Czech companies, but it's I'm happy to do it. You know. <laughs> no, the reason why is, given the fact that Volkswagen was attacked, this means that there's a possibility plausibility that a Japanese automobile companies would be uh, facing the similar criticisms as well because, you know, we're not exactly sure what these automobile parts were that the U.S. government has identified as using forced labor and that's why they have stopped the imports of Volkswagen uh, luxury cars. It could be Toyota, it could be Honda, it could be one of these Japanese companies and that would have a huge reputational risk for Japanese companies as well. So, I think uh, Japanese companies could really learn from the mistakes of Volkswagen and BSF to make sure that they don't suffer the same reputational damage. Um, next, uh, Zuzka, uh, feel free to address any of those issues or some of the questions that I raised uh, previously. Uh, so you were asking, if I remember correctly, on uh, Russian and Chinese uh, collaboration in the disinformation sphere. Uh, so um, my answer is yes, uh, of course. Um, since 2022, uh, it has been even uh, declared uh, this uh, no limits partnership between uh, Russia and China before the Olympic Games in Beijing. And uh, you could clearly see on the different narratives on different topics that they do share. Uh, they do they do share their statements. So, for example, if you look in uh, how Chinese media report on the war in Ukraine, on the invasion of Russia to Ukraine, it has been described uh, exactly how it's described in the Russian media. So Ukrainians are described as terrorists, and uh, Russia has the right to, to get uh, their uh, their uh, part of their country back, right? So uh, this is just one example, but yes, we can definitely see uh, that they are sharing uh, the notes and copying the statements. So uh, on this question, yes, and you wanted to ask about elite capture. Yeah, how do you counter it? Oh yeah, uh, countering. So I may uh, give. Some examples from the Czech, uh, uh, Czech experience. Uh, so when I was talking about this period of time of pro-Chinese optimism in Czechia, uh, there was a lot of elite capture among politicians. Uh, but at the same time, the Czech Republic has the advantage of having a very active uh, civil society and, uh, um, and open media. And this has, of course, uh, they of course paid attention to this elite capture. It was broadly criticized and there was a lot of uh, civil society groups, media and students who did actually a lot of work and criticized this blind uh, blind turn to China and uh, they stressed again the, uh, the human rights and our values which we have in all our strategic documents and diplomats should follow them. You know, So uh, I think that was one of the important aspects which uh, has been very present uh, in Czechia. Yeah. So that's on that. Then maybe a um, new question. Encountering disinformation um, in your country, should it be done by the Czech government or should it be done between Central Eastern Europe countries? Should it be done by EU? Is it NATO's role? Um, how, who is the actor who should be dealing with this issue? It's a tough question and uh, exactly the right question we should be asking. Um, but before we jump into the discussions, who should be dealing with it? I think every each of us should be dealing with it and asking questions. How can we tackle uh, tackle this information? Because it starts with the education, right? It starts um, um, at schools with media literacy. So then it's, uh, for example, a task for ministries of education. But uh, then you have ministries of interior who should also address the issues. So I think every each of the bodies you mentioned should. Uh, should tackle this information and have um, you know, some policies or suggesting policies um, uh, for governments to, to take. So 
yeah, I think it starts with individual individuals, and we see a rise of uh, different NGOs um, identifying uh, disinformation, educating public. Uh, but it is a, such a broad and new issue that uh, we really have to uh, tackle it together. And the last question is on the impact of generative AI in countering disinformation and the impact of disinformation in general. Because was that the two weeks ago uh, we had the head of the UK National Cybersecurity Centre come here on this podium mm -hmm. to talk about how the UK is trying to counter this rise of generative AI and disinformation. And I'm wondering, um, is that also a big issue that's being talked about in Czechia or Central Eastern Europe? Because UK is now talking about this, G7 is talking about this, US is talking about this, Japan is now creating new AI cyber center to try and deal with this, different ministries are now putting in a lot of investment and uh, public money in countering some of these AI, generative AI threats to, in the information sphere. Is this a topic in Czechia? Uh, it is a topic, but I would say more uh, on the academic and more on the um, expert level. And it has not been as uh, advanced and uh, as in the countries you mentioned, as in the UK or US. So again, this is a homework we, we have to do. Um, at the same time, when it comes to disinformation, uh, there is this advantage of Czech Republic as having unique Czech language. So it is uh, more difficult for AI to, for example, translate some of the disinformation to Czech language because you, as a reader, as a native speaker, you can uh, easily recognize that it was, a, it was a AI translating or it was a robot translating. Um, uh, the news or the disinformation. So looking at the, uh, the level of development in text, uh, speech, audio, video on generative AI, I'm not sure if we could be uh, that confident in the next year or so, but... Uh... True, yes. I think so. so Martin, uh, easy questions for you. Um, did, you did you want to address the question of, uh, yeah. What, when push comes to shove, uh, what would Czechia do? What would Central Eastern Europe do? What would EU or NATO do? At this point, the only answer that I can give that is correct is that uh, we don't know, because the political establishment in Europe is trying to figure out what to do about Taiwan, what to do um, with our broader engagement with um, the Indo-Pacific. But, you know, Working at a think tank, my job is to create actionable policy ideas, talk about concrete stuff. But I think that sometimes it is important to um, take a step back and talk uh, more about uh, a, a political philosophy approach to some of the questions that we tackle. And I think that um, right now, what we are seeing within the European Union is an identity crisis. I think that the EU is very much at the crossroads and uh, we have to come back to the very fundamental questions that uh, we have been asking in Europe when processes of uh, European integration first started. I think that we are once again at a stage where uh, we need to evaluate what we want from the European Union and from um, European integration. Do we want to move in the direction of Europe of nations, um, where member states of the European Union would still retain a very significant degree of um, sovereignty and would um, work more on a principle of consensus. So that's not a new concept. Um, Charles de Gaulle was one of the first European thinkers that uh, put it forward. Or do we want to move more in the direction of uh, United States of Europe, where individual European countries voluntarily give up some of their sover sovereignty for the, for the sake of um, creating a political project where together we are um, stronger than the sum of our um, individual strength. And again, this is also not a new concept. So one of the founders of uh, um, European integration, Altiero Spinelli, was talking about uh, the United States of Europe in uh, the early 40s. Uh, Churchill famously brought up this notion uh, when uh, Europe was trying to figure out uh, what to do with our dynamics on the continent after um, the Second World War. And the reason why this all matters is because when it comes to common foreign and security policy of the European Union, few issues are as divisive as uh, European Union's common approach vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. And this has importance for Taiwan as well because even though the European Union has increasingly recognize Taiwan as a like-minded partner in its own right, rather than just a subset of 
uh, relations with China, these issues are um, very much uh, interconnected. So right now we see Europe developing at two speeds. There is a certain um, group of member states which um, still haven't uh, woken up from uh, dreaming the dream of uh, um, Wandel durch Handel, so uh, change through trade. And we have some uh, member states which believe that we have to go back to the idea of the European Union being a normative power and really prioritizing the normative notions of democracy, rule of law, and human rights and, and our foreign policy outreach. I think that it is um, very important that within the European Union, the debate about qualified majority voting in common foreign and security policy resurfaced. So right now, decisions related to common foreign and security policy are uh, governed by the principle of unanimity. So you need consent of all 27 member states to move on. And that's where we see that even individual rogue member states can um, delay, uh, can derail uh, progress. And when it comes to Taiwan policy, member states do it for a variety of reasons. It's not just elite capture. It's not just uh, corruption. Sometimes it's concerns at home. So for example, Spain is very concerned about the separatist movements in the Basque country and in Catalonia and the linkages between Taiwanese independence activists and Catalan uh, independence activists are actually quite strong. Um, for example, Cyprus is uh, very unhappy with the prospect of uh, becoming Europe's Taiwan, even that it faces the unresolved issue of um, uh, Northern Cyprus and uh, Turkish occupation or Turkish presence uh, in the northern part of the island since 1974. So um, I think that uh, what Europe needs is uh, more closer integration. I uh, am very much in favor of moving towards qualified uh, majority voting, and I am one of the few thinkers from Central Eastern Europe who agree with that because that's mainly a Franco German project within the European Union. Um, but Taiwan matters for the EU from this more philosophical perspective because the fact that Taiwan is such a political hot potato for us pushes us to get back to these very fundamental questions of what we want out of European integration. I would answer the same question and also more on the policy side. Uh, and let, let me make it very sim in a simplified way. If you are a dictator thinking about a hostile election, be it uh, invasion such as Russian invasion to Ukraine or uh, blockade of Taiwan or quarantine of Taiwan, which is also an act of war, uh, technically speaking and practically speaking, so what's your thinking? Your thinking is, will it pay off? Well, you have domestic considerations. It will strengthen your rule domestically because it will give you more legitimacy back home. That's something what was the Russian president's thinking before 2014, for example. Apparently now in 2022 as well. I think he failed miserably, but that was clearly the decision which the Russian president took. When the Chinese Communist leadership thinks about taking action around Taiwan and Japan and possibly Philippines, and I mean any, any hostile action from political economic squeezing to quarantine, blockade, or possible open, open warlike conflict and possible invasion. So what would be their thinking? How would be their calculus look like? Well, first question is, how will it end up militarily? Will the United States, Taiwan, and hopefully Japan defend enough and will, will the Japanese military lose? That's the, obviously the main question. There, as Europeans, we unfortunately cannot really be helpful. We don't have major military assets very much available. We cannot really be helpful that much there. But the second question which the Chinese leadership will be thinking about and is clearly thinking about even today is when we, if we take this action against this region, let's say in Eastern, in Eastern Asia, will it what will be the consequence of our action in other regions? How will Europe as a whole react? And that was Mar Martin was tackling. And I mean, today, if it happens today or tomorrow, I'm afraid the real answer would be Europe will do almost nothing. We will do some harsh statements, that's, and that's pretty much it. We will do no sanctions on China, no major sanctions on China, because we as Europeans are too dependent on China. We will basically have European leaders begging China to do it quickly or stop, and that's it, because we need the business to continue, because we are really dependent. That's pretty much where we are as Europeans, as, as a whole, I'm afraid. So what, 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 would be, what, would, what would be the ideal European role in this? And our thinking here is, ideally, 
Europe would have to be able to credibly tell the Chinese leadership, we will put hard sectoral sanctions on China, on you, if you attack Taiwan, because not only you break all the kinds of international laws, but also you basically kill our trade, kill our naval trade with most of Eastern Asia, which for Europe is horribly big. You can imagine, you, you can look up the numbers, it's, it's, it's really, really huge. It would be, basically any conflict that happens in this region will have almost catastrophic economic consequences for Europe. Uh, ec- just purely economically speaking, if I exclude from strategic or ethical point of view. So there is a clear European interest to deter any Chinese military or hostile action in this region. So therefore, I believe, honestly, that Europeans, uh, uh, we as Europeans should be able to credibly uh, threaten China. If you take action, we will take action as well. Similarly, as we are now as Europeans putting very hard sexual sanctions on Russia, which really do hurt Russia. We can discuss it in detail, but it's really, really painful. And honestly, finally, we should have done this in 2014, but we did not. Now we are finally doing it for the last two years in Europe. So, so this, I think, should be the European role. But to get there, to, to have the political will to get there, we first need to, I mean, build the political relations to Taiwan. Some countries are trying, like Czechia, Lithuania, hopefully others in the future, and also limit, decrease our European dependencies on the PRC so that we could actually be honestly sovereign in our decisions and pretty much be able to threaten China in, in, in this and help the calculus which would be happening inside of the CCP leadership in any action. So they would think credibly that if they attack Taiwan or Japan or the Philippines, they would lose Europe as a political partner and as an economic market. That's really where we need to get. We are not there yet at all, honestly, but I think that should be the goal. So doing what we can to change the calculus of the CCP is, seems to be the key here. So we've been talking about these big ideas, but uh, at Orcast, at ESRP, we like to think about practical solutions. So uh, I want to is- ask each of you about what the, uh, in realizing or moving towards some of the big goals that we talked about, what would be the first steps that Japan and Czechia or Japan and CEE or Japan and NATO EU can take uh, in moving forward in the area of economic security, countering disinformation or collaboration with Taiwan. Um, Also in thinking about that question, uh, can you also maybe address the question of, is Czechia really the best partner in CEE for Japan to work on this? And I guess the answer is yes. I want to know what the answer, uh, the reasons for that uh, answer. Because, like you said, there are different countries in the CEE, and perhaps there are better partners, but I'm sure you're here to make the case that Czechia is the hub uh, of East Asia in Europe. So with that, anyone else who wants to go first? Um... I believe that something that uh, would be very useful in safeguarding Taiwan's uh, international space, despite its um, absurd geopolitical status, would be incorporating Taiwan into various forms of uh, multilateral cooperation. And I believe that one region where the European Union, Japan, and Taiwan all have space uh, to um, ramp up their cooperation uh, are the Pacific Island countries. Uh, The Pacific Island countries are uh, quite important from uh, strategic point of view as well, because uh, many of them uh, constitute a part of the uh, second island chain. And uh, we have seen very clearly that uh, over the last uh, few years, China has been uh, making inroads into the region. Um, Taiwan understands it very well in light of the results of the uh, recent uh, presidential and parliamentary elections. The election took place on um, Saturday and the following Monday. Uh, the Republic of Nauru, one of the then four uh, formal diplomatic allies of the Republic of China, uh, declared that they were shifting diplomatic recognition from Taipei uh, to Beijing. But uh, Nauru wasn't the first case. Uh, under uh, the eight years of uh, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, we have witnessed the Solomon Islands uh, make a similar um, shift, which was followed very closely by um, signing a cooperation agreement between Honiara and Beijing on law enforcement cooperation. Uh, Kiribati is um, another country in the region that um, also fell prey to um, Chinese influence efforts. And uh, 
Japan has a, a long history of uh, engagement with the Pacific Island countries uh, through various channels, including uh, uh, ODA, but also uh, human security. So uh, Japan is an extremely important provider of uh, healthcare services to uh, individuals in the Pacific Island states. And I do think that we should recognize healthcare as a part of the uh, broader array of human security issues. Um, the collective West has definitely created a vacuum in the Pacific Island countries. Uh, and uh, here, when I mention the collective West, I'm referring to the United States, but also the European Union, but also Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the engagement of uh, these countries in the Pacific Island countries has been, on, uh, has been declining. Uh, something that I think should be deeply concerning is that the um, renewal of compacts of free association between the United States and um, several Pacific Island countries, including Palau, is now way overdue, even though the Biden administration has sent a, a special envoy for um, uh, Pacific Island countries. So the region faces um, a new uh, nexus, uh, the nexus of uh, security and uh, climate crisis. And uh, solutions to this uh, problem have to be um, intersectoral and multi-stakeholder. And that's why I'm talking about the potential for uh, Japan-Taiwan EU cooperation on that. Um, Japan has been a, an important source of uh, developmental assistance in the region. The EU um, seems to um, want to become a player in the field through its uh, Global Gateway Initiative. And then Taiwan has a very robust experience in providing soft infrastructure development programs that could complement hard infrastructure development supported uh, by the Global Gateway or uh, Japanese government programs. So um, there is a high degree of complementarity. And um, I think that when we talk about um, the development of the Indo-Pacific as a region, as a geopolitical um, hotpoint, uh, there is a lot of space for this type of multilateral engagement that also creates space for Taiwan. Uh, okay, so um, I would like to answer this question that it's a closer cooperation and closer exchanges. And to put it um, uh, in a context, so Europe is now looking to Japan as uh, an example of. Uh, leader in economic security. So this is something what the European countries, specifically Central and Eastern Europe, can learn from Japan. So uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, to increase people-to-people um, -people exchanges, especially uh, expertise and um, academics in this field will be uh, really helpful on both sides. When it comes to disinformation, uh, it's also uh, what these two regions, um, we have a lot of to share. So uh, Central and Eastern Europe has a broad experience with Russian disinformation campaign, and I'm sure Japan has a, um, a great experience with uh, Chinese disinformation uh, operations here. So this is um, another area where we can find a common and mutual interest and learn from each other. Um, and uh, for, the, uh, for the situation of Czech Republic, Czech Republic is one of the few countries in uh, Central or in Europe in general which um, accepted on, or, and approved its own Indo-Pacific policy. And there, Japan is uh, mentioned as one of the key partners, key democratic partners in the Indo-Pacific region. So Czech Republic stated by this strategy that we really want to uh, cooperate with our democratic partners in Indo-Pacific. So it's, uh, it's Taiwan, it's Japan, it's South Korea, Australia. So what to do and then why Czechia or not? So what to do, I mean, economic security toolkits, definitely between Japan and Central Europe. Japan is really leading the policy development. We are really much behind and, and learning from you. Uh, there are things which we need to do and are smart to do it together, such as comparing the strategic dependencies on China we have and learning which of the policies within the democratic societies could really be implemented because it's horribly hard and sensitive. That's why we are really here to talk with Arcast and Borg with, with you guys together on this in the future, because it's not easy. It's political minefield for our every democratic government. So, so it's hard. And that's why we need to work on that together. Uh, also, for example, similar political ticking bomb are electric vehicles. 
basically ch uh, Chinese government with its unfair competition is is pretty much winning over in Europe. And I'm a f I don't I don't know that much about the Japanese market, but at least in Europe, pretty much the CCP is dominating our electric vehicles uh, market and pretty much killing our our companies in Europe. And uh, there is there are strong defensive measures taken by European Commission now, and it will be a tough fight going to the future. So I've, and it will be really strategically important. Even though it doesn't sound like a security issue, honestly, it is at the end because it's really politically strategic for all of us. Um, number two, uh, NATO Japan uh, cooperation. It's already approved. We have an action plan uh, on highest political levels. Uh, not much is being done yet. I think much more should be done. There, there, there's so much which, for example, the SDF knows and can do, uh, and we can learn from that in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, the, I honestly personally believe that the French decision to block and effectively sabotage NATO engagement with Japan is not smart. I would honestly think it's strategically stupid for all of us. I hope it will be changed in the future as a policy decision. And we will have NATO information office here in Tokyo. And not only that, there are many more things which could be done between NATO and, and, and Japan. And actually, there are many people inside NATO, even as an institution in NATO countries, who really want to engage with, with, with Japan. So many of these things will be up and running, I hope, in a year or two. Uh, and uh, the NATO umbrella is actually very good because it can fit in many things which are civilian, which are not purely military, which actually are strategically good for your own defense, meaning here in Japan and for us in Europe as well. Uh, the third area, uh, the, third, the third question was really, is Czech Republic the best partner for, for Japan? I hope we are, because in many ways we are really, we really do understand the major threats such as Russia and China. Uh, yet we are not huge. We are a country of almost 11 million people, but compared to many other countries, global players, we are really small. But um, what I would try to say is that I think much more important for us, generally speaking, is cooperation between effectively the frontline regions. And let me say what I mean. Japan is clearly the regional leader of strategic defense against the Chinese Communist Party in this region. That's clearly happening. Hopefully, the defense will extend over Taiwan as much as possible, because this is pretty much what needs to be done. And I'm not talking only about the military part. It's really about the strategic decisions on economic security, political cohesion, effectively country intelligence as well. All these things are interconnected in, into one basket at the governmental level. And that's pretty much what in our in our region Poland is doing, and other countries such as Czechia are trying to be part of this pack in basically the frontline region, such as Central Eastern Europe, with Baltic countries, Poland, Czech Republic, but Sweden, Finland, for example, which are great allies in this. Uh, and I honestly believe we need more cooperation in this re hopefully regional formats. Uh, I mean, in support of Taiwan, but pretty much because we share many things. We share not only we are democratic. We are really closest partners of the Uni and allies of the United States. You are and we are. We really are honestly scared because of the neighboring di dictator, which is either waging a war in Europe, such as Russia, or preparing for one, uh, such as China. So that's definitely what we share. Uh, and also we share a very, I would say, extended relations to Taiwan. I mean, Japan-Taiwan relations are very deep, even though maybe not so visible, but very deep. And that's exactly what Central Europeans could be doing in support of Taiwan, for example. So I think that should be the main focus. Not, not just bilateral, such as Czech-Japanese, which is good, but this, what has strategic importance is when we actually do this as basically alliances. And that's, I hope, where it will lead to in the future. Thank you so much. So with that, now we move on to my favorite part of the program, you guys. Um, so it's going to be a Q&A for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, if you have any questions, please put your hands up. And when I uh, address you, please uh, introduce yourself and then ask a question. Please keep the questions short and concise. So with that, uh, please, if anyone have any questions, please raise your hands up. Oh, wow, this is fantastic. So why don't we go with one, two, then three? OK, we'll take three questions first. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ryan. Uh, I work for a digital media startup in Japan. I have a question for Susanna. Uh, you mentioned about a survey that uh, a majority of Czech people believe that China was doing better in fighting COVID. So why was that? Because when I was when listening to all you guys speak, Czech seems very tough on China. So is there a divide between the government and the citizens? And my second question related to that is that were there any consequences related to the survey? For instance, 
uh, people uh, starting to decline vaccines created by Western companies or so on? That is a good question, and I wanted to uh, give more context on that. Uh, so what happened? Uh, it was a, uh, we had a different government at the time, and all the government decisions were um, quite, uh, how to say diplomatically, I would say messy. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, like changing of regulations every day. And um, uh, with the, there was a case of face masks. So when COVID started, uh, Czech Republic donated a lot of uh, face masks and other medical material to China as a donation. Uh, but later on, of course, we didn't expect it's going to spread and uh, to be that serious in Czechia. We didn't have enough uh, own, uh, own, uh, like, own materials. So when it came, uh, Czech government decided to purchase a lot of face masks and other medical materials from China. At the time, it was a very expensive purchase. But um, our government, they um, populistically, and you know, in order to explain it to the public, uh, our prime minister, together with the Ministry of Health, they uh, went to the airport and they uh, took those photos with the beautiful, nice mask coming from China. Uh, there, it's a question about to what extent they were really uh, high quality. They were not actually. Later, when they compared it with the masks which we which we received from Taiwan as a gift, um, so that was uh, uh, I would say in strategic communication from the government. Um, they did really well in you know like trying to pretend that they do what they can, but actually the situation in uh, in China public was really uh, really not good. And uh, because of bad decisions, a lot of people died, actually. So this is one of the biggest criticism of, uh, um, at the time, um, opposition parties, that uh, under this prime minister and um, many changing ministries, uh, ministers of health, a lot of people actually died. So I think that the uh, Chinese diplomacy during COVID was really interesting because on the one hand, you had this uh, mask diplomacy, vaccine diplomacy, which seemed to be working well. And then on the other hand, they also engaged in wolf warrior diplomacy. And at times it didn't really seem coherent. And at the end, it looks like both has failed. But uh, that was a great question. Why don't I first collect two or three questions and then get back to the other panelists? So uh, please. Okay, thank you very much for all the panelists and the Igata Sensei today's uh, seminar. My name is Hiroyuki Nakashima. I am coming from Japan Bank for International Cooperation. is a Japanese government bank. I have two questions to anybody on, on, on there. Uh, the first question is about the uh, how do you analyze the uh, last year the German por German government launched the China policy, China strategy. Uh, the the main point I understand is the uh, from the decoupling to the de-risking from between China. So. If you agree with this uh, German policy toward China, I mean the de-risking, what is the key point for the de-risking is the most important point for you. My second question is, uh, it's very a uh, big question and it's also the hypothetical question. Uh, it's a uh, US president election coming this year. Uh, in Japan, it is often said, uh, it is uh, if Trump coming again. Now we often talk about the uh, hobotora. It's almost Trump is coming back again soon. But I don't know, it's a very hypothetical question. But Mr. Trump often say uh, he will ask NATO countries to increase the budgetary burden to the NATO countries. If that happens, uh, which will be uh, not only the, uh, you know, the uh, Trump will, will be uh, all, always a partner, but sometimes he will you know, criticize some of the NATO countries. Do you think that will impact some of the NATO's countries' policy uh, towards China? Because you know China and or the U.S. So do, do you have? Do you expect any uh, influence will be uh, borne by the Trump uh, will be coming back? If thank you. This is why I like the Q and A session. Please, gentlemen in the back. Hello. Yeah. Uh, my name is Margaret Sabukiatis, I'm from Lithuania, so um, I, I really was tempted to, uh, uh, to say a few words. Uh, I don't have a question, I have a short comment, if, if, uh, if you may uh, allow me. Uh, really uh, appreciate uh, uh, the topic and, and, and the gathering today, and it's always uh, nice to hear Czech colleagues uh, speaking. 
it's a bit of a contest of beauty who is the you know more bold uh, in in Europe uh, Lithuania or Czech Republic when it comes to uh, to Taiwan who brings a bigger delegation to Taiwan and 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 so on um but i spent uh, one year here in in tokyo uh, working on on security and and defense issues uh, uh, in in lithuania embassy but not only uh, uh, bilateral but also with like minded countries in in the region so i really appreciate the kind of a collect a collection of topics you you wanted to address uh, today because i would say if you take uh, economic security disinformation cyber is probably missing today but uh, if you add cyber then you have a really you know key topics which connect uh, Japan like minded countries in the region and uh, like minded countries and european countries uh, 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 and, and 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 then we can you know start thinking you know what we can do in that uh, uh, in that field i also wanted to to react to uh, to the lithuanian case which i really appreciated uh, your analysis on 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 lithuania taiwan relations i would not be uh, uh, that pessimistic about uh, you know next elections and what will happen in Lithuania. I think you know this is a democratic cycle. Uh, you know in Taiwan we just had the elections and it was not clear. The outcome was not clear. Even today I would say you know the the outcome is not clear because we you have a president from one uh, party and and the uh, uh, majority in the parliament from the other. How it will play uh, in also in terms of building relations with uh, with european partners we will um, uh, we will see and i think uh, our most difficult time was just after we made those those steps when we were target of of uh, uh, chinese uh, uh, economic pressure uh, after we you know left all those things behind i think uh, our our kind of uh, issue uh, it, it's a success story how you know a small country can withstand a chinese uh, economic uh, uh, pressure so i don't worry about uh, uh, it anymore and i think uh, also it it allows more people to support uh, the policy back in lithuania what i'm worried uh, is that uh, it was it was presented the czech uh, case the lithuanian case that it's still an exception in europe so that's a, a bit of worrying that it's not a trend yet and uh, if you if you think uh, long term, if you think about uh, Chinese uh, uh, threat, it, it's really uh, you know I would wish more countries would would follow that uh, that example. And uh, just last last point uh, about um, uh, decoupling and de-risking. I think that's a, a very critical uh, uh, also issue. And also in today's uh, today's discussion. Uh, I think Lithuania, we are very comfortable with uh, decoupling. Uh, we we have our experience, uh, as it was also presented with uh, with Russia, how we decoupled uh, uh, from them uh, from uh, in in a way of energy energy dependence. I think we can say that we decoupled from China. Uh, maybe we were you know our starting positions were very different from from some um, other countries. Uh, but I think understanding uh, the uh, the threat, the Chinese threat. If you are only de-risking, uh, you are still dependent, and and that's uh, that's really a, a a key key challenge uh, if you want to to, to address that uh, that threat. Uh, I think more people would would be willing to talk about decoupling in Europe, but also in Japan. I would say you know we should be frank because in Japan the discussion is is not about decoupling; it's about the risking. And I I still hear the same arguments as we heard uh, uh, back in Europe with Russia, but it's not possible. Uh, we see that after uh, when the war starts, it it, it becomes possible. It just uh, uh, is much costly, uh, and 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 so on. So I will leave with, with these comments. I really appreciate uh, uh, the discussion and uh, and the book. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. And once again, you don't have to pretend to ask a question. You can say you know, the comments as well. So uh, thank you so much for that. Maybe one more person, and then we'll go back to the speaker. Why don't we go with the student here, and then I'll take you on the next round. Oh, and by the way, if you want to ask questions in Japanese, then feel free to ask in Japanese because we do have uh, int interpreters here. Thank you for your presentation. Well, I'm Akio Tamara. I'm a graduate student from the University of Tokyo. So I've got two questions. First, I'd like to ask about balancing between the EU economic policy and the Czech economic po Czech own economic policy because EU has now discussing the anti coercion instrument, ACI. So in this in this sense, if the Czech is coerced, economically coerced by any country, EU would counteract on the behalf of the Czech. So it is possible to 
entirely rely on the EU. So I'd like to ask about the, how to balance the EU economic policy and the Czech own economic policy. And second, I think uh, I found it interesting to assess the US as a threat of the economic, economic, economic policy for the Czech Republic because it is fact that US has, has sanctioned European countries on a, in an extraterritorial manner for secondary sanctions. So it is possible that uh, it is possible to regard the US as a threat for the economic security for Central European countries. So I'd like to ask about how to assess the US as a threat or not. Great question. Thank you so much. So we had four great questions and one comment. Uh, anyone, if you want to react to any of that, please. Uh, thank you very much for the questions and for the comments. Uh, I would like to begin by briefly addressing the question about the German strategy. One of the uh, most prominent uh, contemporary uh, German scholars of uh, Chinese politics is uh, Dr. Janka Oertel from the European Council on Foreign Affairs. And uh, shortly after the publication of the German China strategy, she published her own book. And um, I think that uh, the title of her book is the best summary of what the German China strategy is. So, uh, the end of the China illusion, the end of the China illusion. I think that the publication of the uh, German uh, China strategy is um, really a tangible manifestation of the fact that Germany is waking up from uh, the dream of uh, Wandel durch Handel, uh, change through trade. Other European countries perhaps not so much, but Germany is at least taking a step in um, the right direction. Uh, looking at the German-China uh, strategy uh, from the vantage point of Taipei, I think that it is uh, quite encouraging that the current coalition government has become much more proactive in engaging Taiwan. There is a section of the German-China strategy dedicated to um, the relations with Taipei. So um, the strategy states explicitly that the German uh, coalition government recognizes that China's military action vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan would uh, be uh, catastrophic for uh, German economic interests and for, um, for German businesses. Additionally, uh, since, the, uh, since the work on the China strategy began, we have also seen an increase in uh, level of interaction between high-level officials on the German side and on the Taiwanese side. So uh, last year, um, uh, Bettina Stark watzinger the German Minister of uh, Science uh, from the uh, Liberal uh, Free Democratic Party, uh, traveled to Taiwan, and she was the first uh, German federal government minister in 26 years uh, to come visit Taiwan. And those exchanges um, go in uh, both ways, because um, also last year during the summer, uh, the German Minister of Justice received his uh, counterpart, Minister Tsai, um, uh, from Taiwan in Berlin. So in that sense, it's encouraging. But I think that what we really need to be very careful about is monitoring the German implementation of the, of the China strategy. So the strategy itself is very ambitious but it remains to be seen how well it will be implemented. And uh, one of the biggest concerns that I have about the applicability of the German-China uh, strategy is the fact that, um, unlike Japan, for example, Germany is not a unitary state. Germany is a federal state. And um, 16 uh, uh, Bundesländer, the uh, 16 uh, federal states in Germany, um, have uh, quite a lot of uh, room to build their own uh, relations uh, with China. And I think that um, the case of uh, Hamburg, for example, is an illustrative case of how um, China can uh, really penetrate um, subnational entities in Europe and how, um, how subnational diplomacy can be a tool for uh, Chinese elite capture as well. So the German-China strategy is an instrument for facilitating horizontal coordination across different executive bodies in the federal government. What the China strategy is very conspicuously lacking is a vertical coordination between the federal government and subnational entities.
I would briefly add, uh, on the German-China strategy, I fully agree with what Martin says. I basically would describe it as a messaging document, which says the right things, basically the risking from China, that's good to say it, but it doesn't have any action plan. Basically, my main criticism against that is, or in, towards the current German strategy, German-China strategy, is that its main message is, China is a risk, and we will do nothing about it. Meaning, we will not tell or... Um, not, no, German government will tell it to German businesses, it's a risk, watch out, but it will not take action, which would, in some cases, for example, force German companies to make smarter decisions, such as, for example, the Japanese economic security strategy is actually doing many, many things which are very, very substantive. So there is a lot of policy action taken between Japanese government and towards Japanese businesses. In Germany, this is very much not happening. And it was a deliberate decision because, honestly speaking, many large German businesses have huge interest in China. So touching this interest from a political point of view of German federal government would be very politically risky for domestic reasons because those companies would fight back. And that's my main criticism because that's our main problem. So good is being discussed, but again, we are waiting for the action. And if you look to like when large German companies are basically saying our wave of the risking from China is doing more in China, we are like, what? But they are like CEOs of these companies who are saying it well publicly. It's not the whole Germany. There are many good players in Germany, like the General Federation of Industry, the BDI. They are making very smart China strategies as private entities. And I think they, they, hopefully they will get more traction inside of the German political market. So that's, that's the good news over there. Um, there was a question about if Donald Trump wins, what it means. So let me just share very briefly, let's say the assessments which I keep hearing in many European capitals, kind of what, what would it mean for us in Central Europe? Uh, and again, in, in, just in bullet points. First, if Donald Trump as US president ends US support for Ukraine, it would be horrible. And it would practically mean that Ukraine would not have enough ammunition to defend itself. And it would quite likely have to basically give up. Ask for, peace, ask for peace or ceasefire quickly. The question is if Russia would follow that, if, if it happens. So that's, problem, that's issue number one. Second question is, would potential President Trump withdraw the United States from NATO? I mean, the general understanding is not, uh, but his pressure on NATO allies to increase the defense spending would be very brutal, which, I mean, in many ways, he is right. He is actually, but the way how he says that it pretty much undermines the whole alliance. But it's, it's a real problem that many European allies do not spend the minimal level to 2% to, to, to of GDP. And it's our overall problem. Czech Republic has been one of the, uh, the, the irresponsible players until recently. We did not spend enough ourselves as well. So that's the second area. Uh, the third thing, which honestly is the most concerning, strategically speaking, is that uh, we could potentially expect basically a large trade policy confrontation between a potential Trump administration and the European Union. There are many disputes brewing up now already during the Biden administration between the EU and the Trump, Trump uh, sorry, Biden administration. Uh, and if President Trump would be there and if he would go ahead with the policies which he and his people are discussing, there would be a lot of disputes, uh, which really could have strategic impact on U.S. Uh, US Europe relations, which might trigger some of mainly Western and Southern European countries to basically say, look, the U.S. under President Trump is not reliable. Let's really go ahead with China on trade. And I'm really scared of this scenario, honestly. And it's quite realistic from how I, how I understand it. The fourth topic is really the China policy discussion. My guess would be if President Trump, uh, if Donald Trump is elected, Many countries in my region, in our region, Central Europe, would think, what can we do with the U.S. so that we persuade the Trump administration to keep some of the U.S. troops, U.S. military presence in Central Europe, which we need because of a potential Russian attack. And the, and the, the response to this is, well, first, let's engage Taiwan positively, as Lithuania is doing it, as Czechia is doing it now. So I hope others would follow and do similar things. Uh, because that's, that's exactly what makes sense. If you're, there is not much of a risk for Central Europeans to engage Taiwan. We are not under military threat of China, unlike you are, so we, it should be more for free for us to do so. So I hope, I think that would be one of the consequences for a potential Trump presidency for Central Europeans to think in this direction. 
And the last question to answer on the ACI, on the anti-coercion instrument. So basically what it is, it's a EU response on Chinese, after China pressured Lithuania, uh, the tool should be a collective defense tool in economic terms. So basically somebody from outside of the European Union uh, pressuring a member state of the EU, then the others would rise and basically stand up for the one who is being attacked. That's the logic, something like collective defense alliance like NATO, but in economic terms. And that's great. Hopefully it will work, honestly. We, we really hope it will, it will be workable. It will, make, it will be deterring possible Chinese host economic hostilities against countries like my own, like Czechia. Um, the, the concern is that uh, there might be many ways how not to make it work, honestly, uh, because it's not like... For example, just give, let, let me give an example. And I think my friends in Lithuania saw the same. So if you are a small country in Central Europe and you, are in, you want to engage Taiwan very openly, you are not only facing Chinese government pressure, but many other allies are basically very privately, and that's good, very privately telling you, don't do it. You will bring us, we will bring us in a trade war with China. And we, we don't want you to do it. Please don't. And they are really pressuring. It's, but it's kind of normal because like in every family you have disputes, right? And it's really about how you solve the dispute. So we talk to each other privately in Europe as, as much as possible, and we keep persuading each other whether it makes sense or not. So it's a really important part of decision-making on the alliance level. Uh, your last question was about uh, these American secondary sanctions on European companies. They are happening. They have been happening, for example, related to the Iran deal. So mainly French, uh, Spanish, and Italian companies were targeted by American secondary sanctions. And they didn't like it, obviously. Uh, similar like Spanish companies buy U.S. sanctions on Cuba, uh, for, for example. So it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. Uh, at the end, it creates bad blood between allies, which is understandable. Uh, honestly, there is no silver bullet solution to it, just more talking. But at the end, it's as, it, in some cases, it's a zero-sum game. Because the question is, do we want European companies to be effectively sponsoring Iranian nuclear program? I personally think we do not, do not, but some governments basically think it's okay for them to do it, so they have to face the consequences, which unfortunately spills over the strategic relations, because then there is bad blood between us, for example, with the United States. So it's not easy, and honestly, it will get very, very hard when it comes to China, because you will see, or we will see, a lot of U.S. pressure on European allies saying, look, China is preparing for a conflict. Are you going to sanction China with us? Are you going to pressure China from stop doing it? And some Europeans will say, no, we, we will keep our business. And then we will have a lot of pressure between ourselves as allies. So I think we can expect that. It will not be easy, but we need to be ready at least for it. I know time is up, but there was a lot of hands up. So I want to go one more very quick round. We're going to go five, 10 minutes long. I'm sorry. If you have any questions, please put your hands up. Let me see them so that I know how to time it. We have one, two, any other questions? One, two, three. Okay, so I'm gonna ask each of the three of you to keep your questions to 20 seconds. So one, two, and three. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Thomas Sullivan. I, I just wanted to bring to your attention that uh, China is Japan's largest trading partner. The figure is about $350 billion a year of two-way trade exports and imports. What would you uh, recommend uh, Japan to do, uh, given that the Czech-China trade is almost zero? Thank you. ヒョンゴで失礼します。え、平川崎と言います。日本の日本人の学生です。あの、さっき。です。すいません。え、先ほどあの、ヤンダ社長がおっしゃっていたと思うんですけれども、実際に台湾で軍事衝突が起こったと
Um, thank you for a uh, very interesting presentation. My name is Naoto Ashida, a student of the University of Tokyo. Uh, I see the article in Japanese newspaper, um, Central and East uh, Europe uh, politic get more chaotic, more and more chaotic. And uh, if change, change the government uh, happen, the policy of security and diplomacy is a dramatically change. Uh, among uh, politicians of Czech Republic, uh, how wide or general the thought is on uh, China is sweet and we should cooperate with Taiwan. Thank you. So uh, if you, know, you want to address that very quickly, three questions, anyone? Uh, thank you for your question uh, about whether sanctions uh, imposed on Russia are enough or not. I think that this is um, an extremely important question uh, that uh, Taipei is asking itself as well. So uh, recently, um, something that became a subject of uh, important debate in uh, Taiwan and particularly in economic policy circles in Taipei is uh, the issue of Taiwanese companies um, avoiding sanctions and uh, continuing doing business uh, with Russia. Uh, Taiwan is um, quite highly skilled in production of uh, machinery, which is used by uh, Russian entities for um, the manufacture of weapons. And some of the entities which have been purchasing Taiwanese equipment are um, very explicitly on the, on the sanction list, for example, by the US government. So one of the largest nuclear research institutes in, uh, in, in, in Russia has been sourcing its uh, machinery from, uh, from Taiwan. And the issue is that uh, while sanctions are effective for uh, targeting direct exports, but uh, there is always a possibility that exports could be routed via a third country. And I think that the situation that we are seeing right now is that uh, sanctions are not very good at addressing uh, this or have not been very effective at addressing these uh, third country routing. So, for example, for the specific case of Taiwanese machinery going to Russia, the largest intermediary is Turkey. And this is a big problem uh, considering the status of Turkey as a NATO ally. So I think that sanction uh, packages uh, from the US and from the European Union have to be more robust and also take a look at companies that have been playing a role of those um, intermediaries. That also includes uh, sanctioning Chinese companies that are aiding uh, Russia during the current conflict. So again, in the Taiwanese case, Turkey is number one, but China is number two. And so far, um, even though Europe has been very active in sanctioning companies, for example, in Central Asia that um, work as a third country intermediary uh, with China, um, that has not been uh, very effective. So. Um, I think that the Taiwanese case should be a wake-up call for the European Union with regard to how we should structure our subsequent sanction packages. Uh, so I would like to answer the uh, question on the uh, Central Eastern European politics and uh, changes uh, when it comes to elections. Um, of course, like when uh, uh, you observe um, in the political environment in Central and Eastern Europe, you can see that after the elections, oftentimes the foreign policy is changing as well. Um, we can see now, for example, changing of uh, politics in Slovakia, which is really disturbing uh, as a neighboring country to us. Um, you can see like, more are there examples, and we have election in one and a half year, so uh, we are also looking uh, in the future and what can we expect from the future government. Um, um, for the Czech case, it might be the, the strongest party is now the populist party, but uh, as uh, most uh, analytics believe, they won't change the politics towards uh, China and Taiwan that much. Because as I mentioned previously, the disappointment uh, uh, from the Chinese investment was so big that uh, there is literally no one in the government or in the, among the politicians believing now that there, should, there will be anything beneficial coming out from improving relations with China. Uh, and uh, I think the current government and also other stakeholders are really working hard on deepening the 
uh, relations with Taiwan as it's our democratic partner. And um, other partners are the democratic countries in the, in the Indo-Pacific region, as I mentioned previously. So um, I believe that the, the period of pro-Chinese optimism uh, was just a turn, and we are back on the, on the, on the straight line of uh, the European values of human rights, uh, rule of law, and respect and dignity. I'll be quick uh, on the large Japanese trade with China and what can we do about it. I mean, uh, I can just give an, a good example from Europe and from, from Lithuania, for example, which is doing a great job in, in that sense. Uh, always the national policy is a combination of what the government does and what the society does. And obviously the government regulates, gives laws and so on. But when it comes to trade, it's hard because of Fortunately, we are living in free society, so, so, so it needs to be very specific and very exact. So there could be some regulations which the governments put on businesses, such as limited exporting things which are hard for national security, dual use exports, these kind of things. That's where the Japanese government is doing quite a lot, and we are trying to learn from that. But when it comes to like general civilian business, I mean, car making industry, things which are not like defense related directly, it's much harder to regulate it, and that's fine in, in free market society. So what it comes to is decisions of the business leaders, whether they believe doing this business actually makes sense midterm and long term. And here comes the governmental role. Governments cannot really forbid this or ban that, but what they can do is that when they really inform the business leaderships about, first, what are the risks, what are the prospects from their own intelligence, so maybe some closed-door discussions which, which would be happening, to explain to the business community, guys, you are making money now, but look what's coming up, and if you are not smart enough, you will be horribly burned by the, by the dictator, in this case by China. And uh, in the case of Lithuania, for example, the, uh, what is publicly known, there is something called national courses, of, uh, courses on national defense, for example, where the... Uh, defense and security establishment of, of Lithuanian government regularly briefs uh, leaderships from other institutions, not only government, but also private businesses and others. So they have a national consensus or at least the same understanding of what are the threat assessments. In their case, mainly about Russia, what, they, what, the, what for example, Lithuanian businesses can and should expect when it comes to, for example, doing business in Russia or with Russia which now is not happening almost at all. But in the past, that was important to create a national understanding, kind of a consensus among the leadership of about the, basically the political and social elite, where the business part is actually very important, how they decide. But you cannot force them to do it, you need to persuade them. And government can do a lot of persuasion, and I mean in a very positive, friendly way, but explaining it in, in closed-door circles. So I think this is the role of the government and national security establishment, which I understand Japanese government is trying to do as well, and it's not easy. Last thing to answer was the changes of government. Somebody who wasn't mentioned here yet is the Czech president. He was just elected a year ago. He has four more years to go. He's very popular. And uh, just to mention two things he has done, uh, right after being elected, he accepted, accepted uh, first two phone calls he got. First, President Zelensky of Ukraine. Second, President Tsai Ing-wen of Taiwan. He was the first European elected head of state who had a direct phone call, publicly acknowledged phone call with the president of Taiwan. Uh, and he said he will do it again. He's, he's looking forward to, to meet her in person. Again, something what no other European head of state has done. Second thing, just after uh, election of uh, new President Lai in Taiwan, uh, Czech, Czech president was the only European head of state who congratulated uh, Taiwan on the elections. I think the wording should have been much more explicit, but he is still the only European head of state to do so. Uh, and I think those are symbolic things. But it only shows you how deep the policy is, at least on the presidential level, for example. So we have some wider consensus among the Czech political establishment on Taiwan. I hope it will continue, but at least this is what we have for now. Thank you so much. So with that, uh, Jakob, Zuzka, Martin, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to further institutional cooperation between ESRP and EVC in the coming future. Thank you, everyone, for joining the discussions. And once again, thank you to all of the students for arranging this. Please join me in a uh, loud, uh, oh, I'm just tired from all that. Please applause the speakers. Thank you so much.
By the way, we have another Japan-US event coming up on the morning of March 4th, and then a Japan-US semiconductor event on March 29th. That one's from uh, 1 p.m. to 6 p.m., so please save the date if you're interested. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.